It is certainly good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Um, I think Joe almost handed me a visitor card when I walked in. Uh, so it's been, it feels like it's been forever, I know. Uh, just uh, thank you for your prayers for me and my family. Uh, we had that nasty stomach bug come through last week. I know some of you are battling that as well. And I uh, just appreciate prayers and cards and all of you who checked in. But we are healthy and on the mend. So just thank you again for your prayers. I appreciate Pastor Troy so much. Uh, boy, a lot was put on him last weekend. And so very thankful for uh, his faithfulness and his service and so many others stepping up in other ways. But if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and grab and turn with me to Psalm 102. Psalm 102, we are continuing our series on biblical lament. Uh, and we've titled this study, Songs of Sorrow. And the reason we have called it that is because each week we are looking at a psalm dealing with the subject. And the psalms are the Bible's songbook. Uh, and, and so what, what we learned a few weeks ago is about a third of these psalms, um, they are laments. They are dealing with this, this issue of grief and sadness and heartache. And, and, and maybe, maybe you're kind of hearing this and you're going, what are you trying to do, Pastor? Are you trying to bring us all down? And the answer is not at all. Uh, you know, the, the purpose behind the study is not, not, to, not to bring you down into the valley, uh, certainly not to open up old wounds that, that are there, uh, but it is to equip you for the inevitable hard days that are ahead. And, 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 and I say that, under, maybe some of you are like, why are you such a pessimist? Right? Like, well, yeah, are things really that bad? And, and, and the reality is this. I hope you understand that. We live, we live in a world that has been affected by sin in the fall. Right? And because of that, we experience suffering and sickness and death. It won't always be that way. Right? There's a day coming when Jesus Christ will return and he will set all things right. But we're not there yet. Right? And so until that day comes... There will be difficult days. There will be hard days. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world you shall have tribulation. Right? Job said man is, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Right? If you sat around a campfire, you know. Right? That's how that works. Right? So, so I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I'm just trying to prepare you. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're going... Pastor, life's pretty good right now. Why do we have to think about these things? Well, I just want to prepare you for days when life is not so great. That doesn't mean God's not good. It doesn't mean God's not faithful. It doesn't mean he's not sovereign. It just means that there's going to be some hard days ahead. And some of you are in the middle of it. And so I want to not only equip you for hard days ahead, but I want to remind you that when those days come, right, in our suffering, in our sorrow, in our sinfulness, we can turn to the Lord and not away from Him. Right? And there's the temptation, right? When things get hard, there's a temptation for us to say, Lord, you've done me wrong. And I don't want to talk to you, and I don't want to gather with your people, and I don't want to worship you. There's a temptation to turn away from him and not to him. And the purpose of biblical lament is to turn your heart to the Lord in the midst of your suffering and grief. It is these songs, these songs of sorrow that we have in the Psalms, they are a gift from God to us. They're a means of worshiping him when we don't know how or when we don't feel like we can. They can provide us words when we don't have words. They, they, they take us on a journey. So we begin oftentimes pleading, right? Pouring our heart out to the Lord and end up praising. So many times they, they begin in heartache and they end up hopeful. That's the purpose. Right? That's the goal. Right? In your suffering, in your heartache, you want to end up standing on the solid rock. That's the purpose. And so that's what we're going to do, and Psalm 102 is going to help us with that this morning. Let's just look at these first few verses. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll ask the Lord's blessing on our time. And, and I'll just remind you, the, the, the titles, like the, postscript, or the prescripts of the Psalms are part of the inspired word. So I'm going to read that as well. It says, a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint 
and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, thankful this morning for your word. Lord, I've been reminded a number of times this week of its great power. And I pray now that your word would be at work in the hearts and lives of your people in this place. And I ask, Lord, that you would grant your servant power. Lord, not in any way to lift up or exalt me, but Lord, that your word would be lifted up, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. So now may your Holy Spirit be at work in me, in spite of me, to bring about your good purposes. Help us, Lord, we pray. Be gracious in Jesus' name, and amen. So within the title of the psalm, it says this is the prayer of one who is afflicted. Right? Affliction has the idea of, of pain, of hurt, right? That this psalmist is experiencing something of some nature that is bringing hurt and heartache into his life. And he's pouring himself out before the Lord. And, and again, right, there are some of you who are right now in this moment experiencing, experiencing affliction. Others of you... Not so much right now, right? And that's okay. It's just a reality that there are those here this morning who are afflicted. And it comes in many, in many shapes and fashions, doesn't it? Affliction can be relational. Right? Maybe, maybe you, you, you've got a boss or a co-worker that just never lets up at work. And it is a thorn in your flesh day after day after day. Uh, It may be that it's inside your home where that affliction lies. It could be the person you lay in bed to next at night, your husband or your wife, that there's just this continual tension in your home. Maybe it's not between husband and wife. Maybe it's between parents and children. That, That you have children who are rebellious and hard and cold. Maybe even children who have walked away from the faith this morning. And it is a source of heartache that just does not relent. Affliction. Maybe you have relationships that have been broken off, that once were people who were so close to you, and now they're not. And you feel the loss, and you feel the loneliness of that. It can be relation. It can be, it can be financial, right? If, if you're, right now, I mean, I think many of us are feeling the strain of of, of inflation, you know, maybe it's, it's your retirement that's taking a hit, and you're just like, man, I don't, you know, I don't know how to handle that. Maybe you're looking at your monthly budget, and you're just going, I don't, I don't know how we're going to make the bills. I mean, everything has cost more than it did, and I don't know how we're going to handle this. And, and it's an affliction. It's a constant right in front of you. I don't know how we're going to deal with this kind of affliction. It can be financial. It can be material. It can be physical, right? right? Maybe you're someone who is day after day living in constant pain. Right? And, and from the outside, everything looks fine. So nobody really knows it. But inside, your body is betraying you. And, 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 and you're hurting day after day. And it just never seems to let up. Maybe you're just really sick and tired of being sick and tired. Maybe you have terrible disease that is just tearing you up from the inside. Affliction, it comes in many ways, doesn't it? It can come as you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And you're experiencing the loss of that. And in those moments, there is this danger, right? And the psalmist is there, right? He says, this is a prayer of one afflicted. I'm feeling the pain. I'm feeling the heartache. And in this moment, he doesn't understand why. As you read throughout Psalm 102, there's no explanation, right? Last week, when Pastor Troy shared from Psalm 51, the affliction was clear. It was because of the sin of David that he was experiencing the affliction. And, And sometimes that's how it works, right? Sometimes the result of our pain is our fault. It's our foolishness, it's our sinfulness that has brought this into our life, and we can just look and we can be like, Lord, I understand why I'm going through this. 
But sometimes it's not so clear. Sometimes You can't always look at your life and go, I know exactly, God, why this is happening. The source of that pain and heartache can be unexplained. That's what we find here. The psalmist is going, Lord, I really don't know why. Not that he's sinless, like, like Job, right? Job was a faithful man who was questioning why these things were coming into his life. Not that he was sinless, we see that as God deals with him, but that there's no clear explanation for why God would allow this to happen. And sometimes then our heart begins to look at others and go, God, how's, why me and not, not them? Look at how they live. Look at what they do. Why would you allow this to happen to me? The prayer of one afflicted. Sometimes the reason for our suffering remains a mystery, doesn't it? We don't know. We don't know the answer. And so the psalmist, in that moment, he's kind of come to the end of himself. And he's just, he's just crying out to the Lord. And he's pleading and he's praying. And he really gives a description in verses 3 through 11 of what, what this affliction feels like for him. Right? So he describes his condition. In verse 3 he says, My days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. That doesn't sound good. Verse 11, he says, my days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Whatever it is that's going on, it seems like, at least it feels like to him, his life is being cut off too soon. Now we realize, right, our life is a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. That's true for every person sitting here today. But here in this moment, the psalmist feels as if There is something, possibly a physical sickness that has taken hold of him that is causing him to realize and recognize the brevity of life in a way that he did not before. I'm wasting away, Lord. My days are passing away so quickly. What has happened? And and, and we don't know the nature of the illness, but we do know it's affecting him both physically and emotionally. In verse 4, he says, My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. In verse 7, he just says, I lie awake. Right? He's not eating. He's not sleeping. Right? The language here describes it, an extended period of suffering. He's lost a great deal of weight. He's emotionally and spiritually drained. And in verse 6, he says, I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness. Like an owl of the waste places, I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. He just feels alone. Desolate, isolated from everyone. This is his experience, worthless and alone. And in verse 8, he even has people mocking and laughing. He says, all the day my enemies taught me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. Can you imagine? You're experiencing this suffering and this heartache and people are enjoying it. (laughs) They're relishing in his suffering. And so in verse 9, he says, For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. And notice verse 10. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. Who's he talking to? He's talking to God, right? He says, God, you, you're the one who did this, right? You have picked me up and thrown me down. It's because of you, Lord, that I'm going through this. And there's there's certainly a sense that's true, right? God is sovereign over these things. God is the one who permitted Satan to do what he did in Job's life, right? And and, and this psalmist understands the the sovereignty of God, and he's wrestling now with what he knows to be true about God. I'm hurting. I'm afflicted, Lord. I'm suffering. He feels as if God himself is against him. Now, what do you do in those moments? In the moments when you feel afflicted, when your heart aches, when you are down, discouraged, maybe even depressed, and this may perhaps has gone on for a long season, what do you do in those moments? You do exactly what the psalmist does here in Psalm 102. And, and what he does is helpful for us. And I want, 
I, I want to say, we're going to see this pattern over and over again. But notice, and we, we read it in verse 1 and 2. He says, hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. What does he do in the midst of his hurt? He prays. He prays. Right? He turns to God, not away from God. Right? This is important. Is his heart aching? Does he feel betrayed? Does he feel despised? Yes, but he doesn't turn away. He turns to the Lord and cries out, Lord, don't hide your face from me in the day of my distress, in my trouble, in my hurt. Lord, I need you to hear me. This is not some casual prayer. Right? This, is not, this is not him just going through the motions. Right? This is, this is a, a man who is pleading with God. For help. All alone. And the audible cries just come out. Have you ever been there? Yeah, some of you are nodding along. Some of you have yet to walk those, walk those paths. It's hard. But he does exactly what he should do. He turns to the Lord. He's not carefully crafting some prayer He's just pouring out his heart. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you in those days, if you're in them, if you're in them now, pray. Pray when you don't feel like praying. And you may not feel like praying. You may not even feel like God hears you when you're praying. If you're, if you're like the psalmist, you're going, Lord, you have, you're not for me, you're against me. That's not true. But it feels that way. It feels that way. In those moments, turn to him. And you're going to be tempted to turn away from him. You're going to be tempted to turn to something else. Isn't that so often how we deal with heartache? We deal with pain. We don't want to turn to God. We want to turn to... People do it all the time, right? Alcohol, drugs, sex. Right? You go on a shopping binge, you go on an eating binge. Right? You turn to something, something else to deal with your pain and your heartache instead of turning to him. But the psalmist is very instructive here. In this moment, you pray. You go to the Lord. You know, remember what Pastor Bill used to say? It's on, that, it's on the picture out there in the hallway. Don't give up. Look up. Don't give up. Look up. And that's what the psalmist does in this moment. In the depths of his despair, he cries out to the Lord. He prays. He turns to God and pours out his heart. That's what he saw in verses 3 through 11. He's, he's very open and honest about what he's feeling, about what he's experiencing. Right, this is number two in this moment, right? So, Number one, you must turn to the Lord. You must turn to the Lord. But then secondly, bring your complaint. Right? Be, be open and honest with God. Tell him how you feel, how you really feel. Right? The psalmist here in, in Psalm 102, in excruciating detail, he just he lays out for the Lord the effect of his affliction. Lord, this is... I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping, I feel like I'm wasting away. Does God know those things? Of course he knows those things. But the psalmist is just very open and honest. What is it that he's doing? He's bringing his complaint. You say, is that the right word, pastor? Well, I mean, that's what he said. Right? He said it right in the opening. He says, a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint. Before the Lord. He's complaining. You say, that can't be right, right? We, we, we're not supposed to complain. Right? That, I mean, is it ever right for us to complain? Philippians 2, 14, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Paul says, don't, don't complain. Here the psalmist is complaining. Is he wrong? Is he sinful? Well, we saw the same language in our scripture meditation, didn't we? Psalm 142, in verse 2, right? The psalmist said, this is David, right? He's hiding out in the cave. He says, I pour out my complaint before him. Same language, same word. Well, 
this word complain is used in the book of Job more than any other place. Is it, is it wrong that they bring? Right? We're, we're looking at this, and I, I'll just go ahead and lay my cards out, okay? It's not wrong. So how do you know it's not wrong? Well, because it's the word of God here. Right? This is an individual lament, an individual complaint, and yet it's, it's, it's recorded for us in the Word, and it would be used by the people of God as they corporately came together to worship Him. Corporately, the people of God would come, and they would bring their complaint before the Lord. So, we've got to ask the question, if it's okay then how do we do it in a way that it is okay? Because Paul warns us it can be very sinful for us to complain to the Lord. This is not uncommon in the scripture, okay? Lots of why and how questions that would fit the form of complaint. Listen to Psalm Psalm 10 verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Very familiar in Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus took these words up and used them from the cross himself. Questions of why, questions of how. Psalm 13, 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? The psalmist here, what? They're expressing their sorrow, their fear, their frustration, their confusion. But who are they expressing it to? They're expressing it to the Lord. This complaint is not outward. It's not an accusation against God. They are going to God. And and that that gives some insight. What's the difference between a biblical complaint that is okay and a sinful complaint (coughs) that God would hold against us? I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul points back to the the Hebrew people, the Israelites who are going through the wilderness. And many of them were struck down in the wilderness. And why did Paul say they were struck down? Because they complained. (laughs) Their complaint killed them. What's the difference between the psalmist's complaint here and the complaint of the Israelite people that Paul points to in 1 Corinthians 10? Well, the key difference is one of faith. That's the key difference. Right? The, the complaint of the Hebrew people going through the wilderness was not a complaint of faith. It was an accusation. God, you have betrayed us. You have let us down. You have not kept your promise. They, have, they blame Moses. They blame God for their, their failure. But the accusation, the complaint that is coming here in Psalm 142 and, and these other psalms that we mentioned, it's one of faith. It's being offered up not as, a, not as an accusation to God, but as, God, I know who you are. I know that you are ever-present, and yet in this moment, it doesn't feel like you're present. I know that you hear my prayers, Lord, but in this moment, it doesn't feel like you're hearing me. They're turning their complaint to the one who can bring them help. The Hebrew people were complaining outwardly. Right? Not to the Lord, but to Moses and to one another. Do you see the difference? There's a, there's a big difference between biblical lament and anger at God. Right? Biblical lament is what? It's, it's looking to God in faith in the midst of your pain. And it's appropriate and it's right. And I think it's something we need to do and we need to do better <coughs> Anger towards God is a moral judgment. You're you're raising your fist to the Lord and you're saying, Lord, you were wrong. You have wronged me, right? You have not done right in this situation. And that is blasphemy and it is sinful. That's the difference. One is a heart of faith reaching out to the Lord. The other is a heart of anger that's that's accusing God of not being who he is. So the psalmist here, right, he just pours out his heart. (coughs) Lord, I know who you are, right? He begins by calling out to him in prayer, but it doesn't feel like you're there right now. 
and it doesn't feel like you care right now. And this is really the beginning, the, the, the turning point of moving from heartache to hope. He's just open and honest with the Lord. And notice, notice the shift in the psalm when you come to verse 12. So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, you pray, you turn to the Lord, not away from him, and you bring your complaint, you pour out your heart, be open and honest. And when you do that, there's a shift here. Right? The psalmist moves from looking inward to looking upward. Right? This is important. Right? In verse 12, he says, But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. Look at verse 17. He says, He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not, does not despise their prayer. Lord, it doesn't feel like you're there. It doesn't feel like you're listening but I know that you are. Do you see the shift? Right? You are enthroned forever. Lord, you're on the throne. You're in control. You're sovereign over my situation, over my circumstances. You're sovereign over everyone's circumstances. And I know that you hear. And I know that you answer. Lord, this is who you are. And this is what you have promised. And I'm going to trust in that no matter what. We said every one of these psalms will lament, almost every, there's a turn. And verse 12 is the turn. Now, we read these psalms and sometimes we feel like that should just happen immediately. <laughs> like, I'm going to pray and I'm going to bring my complaint and then God's going to bring peace to my heart and we're going to end in. It doesn't always happen fast. Right? So I, I want to prepare you. There may be situations of sorrow and grief that are of such that you walk through this process again and again and again and again until the light bursts through. And God is faithful. The light will come. <laughs> I don't know for you how long that may take. It may take longer than you think it should. But this moment will come if you keep turning and you keep trusting and you keep praying and you keep pouring out your heart. This moment where the light bursts through you, O oh Lord, you're going to see a shift in the trust in that promise. You're going to see a movement from heartache to hope. He says in verses 13 through 16, you will arise and have pity on Zion. It's time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Verse 16, he says, For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. Something is happening in his heart now. Well, he's looking ahead. He's saying, Lord, I know that you have a plan for your people. Right? He's, he's beginning to hear the promise of God and trust in the promise of God. What a shift, what a change. Before it feels like God is not who he said he is, and now he's going, Lord, even in my affliction, I see, I see what you have promised, and I'm trusting in those promises. He, he realizes that God has a plan for his people, and that, that there's something bigger going on than just his affliction, that his affliction is part of this plan. And as part of the plan, it's good, and God is going to use it to bring about his faithful purpose right this is what we this is what we run to right in the midst of our heartache romans 8 28 for all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are the called according to his purpose we can be confident brothers and sisters that whatever we're going through is part of god's good plan here's the thing we don't always see that. God sees it, right? He's got the big picture. We don't always see what God sees. Sometimes God graciously allows us to see how things come together. But many times we're left wondering, aren't we? I don't understand why you would allow this, Lord. And yet the psalmist now, with feet on solid ground, is saying, Lord, I see your promises. I believe your promises you're going to do this, Lord. Oh, it's such a powerful moment in the psalm, and I hope you see it. Right? This movement from inward to upward and ultimately outward. Right? In verse 15, he says, Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and the kings of the earth will fear your glory. 
God, you're working in such a way that all peoples are going to recognize who you are. That all peoples are going to bow the knee before you. Now, he's not so, so, so focused on what he's facing in his little world. He's seeing a bigger picture. His heart has begun to move outward. Out, so much so, in verse, seven, or verse 18, he says, Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be recre- created may praise the Lord. Talk about big picture. Right now, he's not just looking outward. He's looking down the line. He's looking into the future and saying, Lord, what you're going to do with your faithfulness and your promises, let it be written down so all peoples can see and know that you are this good and faithful God. That's not where he started. <laughs> but man, has the circumstance changed? Not at all. Circumstance hasn't changed. His heart has changed. He was looking inward, focused on only what he was experiencing. And now he's looking upward. And now he's looking outward. And and he's just saying, Lord, I want you to use this affliction in my life for your glory and for the good of others. As as you are faithful, Lord, to who you are, to the promises you have made, then others are going to see and others are going to know, not just now, but in the future. Can I just say, you never know how the Lord might use your affliction to impact someone else. Now that may not give you, that may not give you peace right now. But I can say from an outside, looking at how God has worked through some absolutely devastating circumstances that I have seen God's hand at work in some mighty ways in the lives of others as a result of what some of you have walked through. Faithfully, trusting, planting your feet on the solid rock when everybody outside would say, I just don't understand. Doesn't mean your faith wasn't shaken. Doesn't mean that you didn't wrestle or question. It just means that you came through and you were still holding tight and holding firm. And other people saw that. And they saw that God is who he said. And God's promises are true. You may not feel that in that moment, but there's going to come a shift when that light breaks through and you're going to begin to to allow your focus to move outward towards others. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. He's he's praying now, Lord, I want them to see. In verse 19, I want them to see, right, that that he, that God, looked down from his holy height from heaven. The Lord looked at the earth to hear the groan of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord, and in Jerusalem his praise, when the peoples gather together and the kingdoms to worship the Lord. I want them to see, I want them to know, Lord, that you looked, that you heard, that you saw, that you kept your promises, and then we're going to praise you together. You see the the shift, right, from pouring out his heart to praise. That's the purpose of biblical lament. It's okay to pour your heart out. It's okay to bring your complaint. It's just not okay to stay there. You keep going, you keep turning, and you keep trusting until that light bursts through. You keep looking upward until the Lord allows that shift to move outward and ultimately Christward. And we see this here in, in this passage. I hope I hope I can I hope I can make the connection for you. In verse 23, he says, He has broken my strength in mid course. He has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my day. You who, whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Now verses 25 to 27 the author of Hebrews actually takes up and applies them to Christ. Right? Hebrews chapter 1, right? in chapter 1, he's, the author of Hebrews just t- 
taking Old Testament scriptures and showing the supremacy of Christ. And so here, when we're talking about the one who laid the foundation of the, of the earth, the one who is the same forever and ever, he's talking about Christ. He's talking about the Messiah. Now, I don't think the psalmist knows that or understands that, but the author of Hebrews pulls it out. And for us now, looking at this psalm today, we can see that this, this psalmist was making, he was, he, was, he was praying more than he knew. He was, notice verse 23. He has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. Not only is this a biblical lament, but it's a messianic prophecy. As this as the heart of this psalmist is looking forward to the promises of God coming to fruition, in verse 28 he says, The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. What he's saying is they're going to be before your face, God. They're going to dwell with you, Lord. How, do we, how is it possible for us as sinful creatures to dwell in the, in the presence of God? Only through the work of Christ. Only through the work of Christ can we dwell in the presence of God secure. And all, although the psalmist doesn't fully grasp everything that he's praying here, for us, looking at this now, we can see the connection. Right? Because of this promised Messiah, because of the one God said would come, this everlasting one who is on the throne, whose days were cut off in mid-course, who, according to Isaiah 53 and verse 4, who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and afflicted by God. You see, this Jesus, he bore our griefs. He bore our sorrows. He was afflicted. For us. Right, and so, I want to remind you of that this morning. In your affliction, and I'm not gonna, I don't want to make light of anything that you may be going through this morning. Because I recognize, and I know what some of you are going through. I recognize that it, it's heart-wrenching. And yet, in the midst of our afflictions, each one of them is a reminder that Jesus Christ was afflicted for us. That in our place, condemned, he stood, and that he took on himself what we rightly deserved. And so as you, as you are walking through hard days, allow it to point your heart Christward to the cross where you can be reminded, whatever I'm facing, it's nothing compared to what my Savior has faced. That Jesus did for me what I could not do. All the suffering, all the affliction, all the heartache is a result of sin and fallenness. But Jesus took it all on himself on the cross. And he did it in such a way that he paid for it in full. And one day when he returns, there's going to be no more sin. And no more sickness. And no more death. What a day that will be. But now, now, brothers and sisters, while we are still in this sinful, fallen world, we must look to him. We must look to him. You may be tempted to turn elsewhere. You may be tempted to turn away. Don't do it. Don't do it. Turn to the Lord. Pour out your heart before him. Bring your complaint, godly, biblical complaint, in faith, and keep coming until the light bursts through. And allow your heart to turn outward. Some of you are on the other side. And I, I can't help but think of, of, of 2 Corinthians 1. Right? The God of all comfort who has comforted us in our affliction. Allows us to comfort others. With the same comfort with which we have been comforted. I don't know what you're walking through this morning, perhaps, but you have a brother or a sister here who has probably walked through something similar. 
and they can come alongside you and they can walk with you. And they can help. They can help lift your heart up and turn your heart to the Lord and say, yes, it was hard, but he was faithful. Yes, my heart was broken, but I ended hopeful. And that's what we want, right? We want to leave here today with our hearts fixed on Christ, trusting in him, our feet standing firmly on the solid rock. We're going to close in prayer. I want to give you opportunity uh, to respond this morning, to turn your heart to the Lord. And our worship team is going to come and they're going to lead us in a moment. We're just going to sing, Lord, I need you as we close together in prayer.